Well, good day, everyone, um, and welcome. Uh, my name is Enrico Fuyano. I'm part of the Cloud Solutions marketing team at Cisco. During the next 30 minutes or so, we'll essentially tackle three topics. Uh, first, we'll review some of the highlights associated with the global cloud adoption study that IDC independently contacted, uh, conducted on, on their own, and we sponsored. Uh, more importantly, we'll review how we can make some of the findings associated with the study actionable for you via the Cisco Business Cloud, Cloud Advisor framework and in conjunction with our Cisco Cloud Professional Services. Now, as much as possible, obviously, I would be remiss if I did not highlight OpenStack-specific uh, trends and, uh, and topics, but the analysis will be a little bit broader, and I hope uh, you will not hold that against me. Um, let's, start, let's start with the study methodology. Uh, it's, it has been a fairly broad study. Uh, that started with over 11,000 executives, uh, director level and above, with a mix of line of business stakeholders who are really in charge of defining cloud strategies in their environments. And then we whittled that down to over 6,100 organizations who had begun to deploy cloud uh, for more than a couple of uh, workloads. Um, the study itself encompasses over 31 countries, and so it's unprecedented in terms of its scale. Well, let's see some of the highlights. Well, first of all, uh, no surprise, cloud adoption is accelerating. Over year over year is a 61% increase. So about 70% now of organizations uh, claim to have some level of use for either private, public clouds or a combination of both. So is it private cloud or public cloud? I believe the debate is over. Organizations want both and there is no doubt about it. Uh, you can see from the projections that private cloud, at least in the next couple of years, um, will continue to enjoy um, growth um, upwards of 40% in terms of uh, spending. But we hear that from customers every day. Um, it's all about putting in place a hybrid cloud strategy. Now, I emphasize cl a cloud strategy, hybrid cloud strategy, 73% um, of the respondents feel they're putting in place one, but that does not necessarily equate to their ability to have a true hybrid cloud or hybrid IT environment um, today, right? And the other consideration is that there is no shortage of interpretations when it comes to what hybrid cloud is. So uh, the interpretation is highly subjective, as you can see, on the left of the slide. So depending on your definition of hybrid cloud, perhaps you do have a hybrid cloud strategy in place. Um, what was more interesting to us is uh, the ability to really segment the bulk of these 6,100 organizations across a number of characteristics, uh, people, processes, technologies, and tools, and to really study how organizations approach cloud, which is now approaching a sufficient level of maturity. Um, so how do they get started from the ad hoc uh, phases of uh, cloud adoption using the IDC taxonomy or the cloud maturity model all the way to optimize cloud strategies in which there is pretty good alignment between IT and line of business stakeholders um, and uh, little or no uh, or mitigated uh, shadow IT. Uh, the most interesting part is also to study across the progression from left to right of uh, characteristics such as technology, people, process, tools, and last but not least, business outcomes to see how that morphs over time. And for those of you who may be familiar with maturity model, is a similar approach. Now, how is the uh, distribution of uh, these organizations uh, uh, actually um, you know, what type of distribution of the population uh, can we see across the five stages of cloud maturity? Uh, last year, we observed that only 1% of the organizations that IDC surveyed claimed to have optimized cloud strategies in place. Uh, well, that number tripled to a whopping 3% uh, this year, uh, but the fact is that there, we have 70% of the organizations that do not have uh, mature or advanced cloud strategy in place by their own admission. 
So there is a gap and uh, plenty of room for improvement. And what that means is that while cloud adoption is growing, um, the ability for the organization to extract maximum value out of their cloud environments is, is not necessarily a following pace. Um, why are we so interested in this type of segmentation? Because what we have seen is that there is a positive correlation between better business outcomes and progressive stages of cloud adoption or cloud maturity. So if you take, for example, that top 3%, uh, the uh, type of business outcomes across a broad number of key performance indicators, be that their ability to uh, reduce IT costs or even influence or help their line of business counterparts influence revenue changes dramatically. And you can see the results on the slide for that top 3% are pretty impressive, they're material. Um, additionally, uh, in terms of the adoption of cloud deployment models, you can see that of that 3% of optimized cloud organizations, 95% of them still use um, private cloud in conjunction, of course, with public cloud. So that reinforces the notion that it's not an either or value proposition, but a combination of, of both. Um, well, OpenStack, you may wonder, what about that, right? Uh, so the good news is that um, across a broad sample of uh, uh, organizations, uh, about 60, over 60,000, they reported, the 60% of them, these are senior uh, decision makers, that OpenStack is top of mind. Uh, it is an important part of uh, their cloud strategy, uh, which is great. Um, that does not necessarily translate into an immediate spending, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that uh, as it relates to the next uh, 12 months. But it's good to see also how the expectations that potential OpenStack users have as it regards to um, what I would call strategic key performance indicators, such as the ability to increase revenue in association with their OpenStack-based cloud services, and even their ability to uh, strategically reallocate their IT budget, investing more in innovation as opposed to maintenance projects is very promising. And you can see almost a 20 to 30% spread compared to the population that doesn't believe OpenStack is an important part of their cloud strategy. So something to continue to observe moving forward. Now, another interesting uh, characteristic is if we were to uh, try to identify what are the common traits from a technological, technological point of view that optimized cloud uh, organizations um, potentially share. Is there anything that we can learn uh, from that? Well, it turns out that, uh, in general, optimized cloud organizations believe in a resilient multi-cloud adoption strategy. So they want to be able to determine where to move their workloads based on a set of governance principles. It's not a winner-take-all scenario, but they choose the cloud service provider and um, private cloud deployments depending on the, the characteristics of the applications. Uh, also, more leading-edge containers, microservices, uh, technologies uh, seem to be more broadly adopted, at least in the pilot phase, if not in production, by the top 3% of the organizations. DevOps, well, intuitively, we all know, right? So it's a best practice, continuous innovation, continuous deployment, and you want to absolutely uh, abate the silos within the organization to implement a, a cloud culture. Uh, the broader question, though, um, which we were able to validate is what's the correlation between uh, cloud maturity and adoption of DevOps. And we were um, not surprisingly, but at least confirmed that there is uh, almost linear correlation among the stages of cloud adoption and uh, the use of uh, DevOps methodologies. Governance, we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's also a hallmark of a well-run cloud-optimized organization in which the IT and business uh, um, IT and line of business stakeholders really share a common view, even when it comes down to defining SLAs jointly. And there are a set of processes that are allowed to do that. Uh, another interesting aspect, there is no question that uh, the increase of cloud adoption is also fueled 
by the adoption of IoT applications that are cloud-based. And that is also true for, for security um, applications that are delivered via the cloud. Now, if you think about it, it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because uh, if you take any market research, talking to customers and say, what's your number one inhibitor and concern moving to public cloud, 48% uh, of them will report security. But as organizations get better and mature the cloud journey, realize the potential of using cloud to secure their own environment. And so consuming applications that are cloud-based uh, is becoming more popular among the cloud-optimized organizations. And that's why at Cisco we have invested in solutions such as CloudLock that, um, and OpenDNS that allow you uh, to do exactly that, aggregating in the cloud a lot of intelligence that you can then use to secure on-prem uh, cloud environments. Uh, IoT applications deployed in the cloud also, um, on average, I believe is 29% among the cloud adopters um, are using some form of uh, cloud-based IoT applications, uh, more in a private or hosted private cloud environment. Um, but 60, that number jumps to 62% if you look at the optimized cloud organizations. So that is a little bit of a set of data points, a lot more in the material that you can download from our website that characterizes um, the, um, techno some of the technological traits associated with uh, cloud optimized organizations. Now what about OpenStack? So how would that picture change if we were to consider um, organizations that have plans to deploy OpenStack. Um, so let's take the first data point. 21% um, of EMEA-based organizations have plans to spend um, op money on OpenStack-related projects in the next 12 months. Um, conversely, if you look at the worldwide pie, um, over 22% of organizations with 250 employees um, have plans to spend money on OpenStack in the next 12 months and beyond. And if you look at the industry verticals, uh, you will see that I uh, was surprised to see a, a long tail. So the, there is momentum uh, in terms of actual willingness to spend dollars on OpenStack projects across a broad range of industries, but the ones that were about the 20% uh, include, and they're not limited to manufacturing, as you would suspect, you know, communications, uh, technology vendors, insurance companies, and wholesale, which is not uh, listed on the slide, and it is about above the 20% uh, range. What about the technological traits? Well, not surprisingly, um, OpenStack adopters are uh, savvier when it comes to hedging their bets, right? So they do want a multi-cloud strategy. They already have in place multi-cloud strategies. And the very reason why they're looking at OpenStack, or at least one of them, is to avoid the vendor lock-in. Now, DevOps, again, much higher than expected uh, um, adoption of DevOps technologies among the OpenStack population. The same, what, what emerges, basically, is a picture that uh, positions uh, OpenStack adopter at least, ad adopters at least directionally as uh, more mature compared to the rest of the population across a number of leading indicators. Now, the more interesting question, though, is what are some of the barriers that separate that 97% of the population from the 3% of the organizations that have been able to optimize their cloud strategy and are correlated with better business outcomes? And so IDC has identified a number of potential barriers. And not surprisingly, not all of them are technologically related. With the exception of the fact that almost to two thirds of the respondents that are not in the optimized stage of cloud adoption, um, they reported basically insufficient uh, tools to monitor, measure, and manage effectively hybrid cloud environments. And that's no surprise if you have tried doing that is very complex. Uh, but at the same time, they also struggle to limit 
the number of uh, even infrastructure standards in the organization. So that increases complexity in that regard. But the bulk and the more visible um, obstacles that the IDC research was able to bring forward are tied to people, processes, and skills. Let's start with the skill sets. I mean, you can just take a walk down the trade show, right, floor, and every other booth is looking for OpenStack talent. Um, so that's potentially um, a barrier. Uh, if as an organization you do not have easy access to um, DevOps engineers and OpenStack talent. So one way to overcome that, um, we have introduced our Cisco MetaCloud solution, which really allows you to uh, consume a private cloud delivered as a service in a data center of your choice, which is OpenStack based, so that you don't have to spend time operating OpenStack, but we'll do that for you. So think of hardware plus software plus expertise and our ability to remotely manage your environment on your behalf. So we become an extension of your IT organization. Um, lagging processes and procedures. That's also an interesting one, right? When you think about it, um, cloud adoption cuts across the entire IT value chain. Uh, even the billing systems, now they need to move from uh, how to account for fixed allocation of IT assets, assets to something that is uh, uh, pay-per-use with the showback, chargebacks, and that it turns out the more customers we talk to as being uh, a fairly uh, challenging step. And last but not least, alignment between, surprisingly, line of business and information technology stakeholders. 91%, um, that, that number really stuck with me, 91% of organizations that are not in the two top most stages of cloud maturity um, point out the fact that they don't have well-oiled processes to get line of business and IT stakeholders even agree on SLAs um, and or don't have a, a documented formal way to escalate misalignments when it comes to SLA and perception. So all of that draws a little bit of a picture, gives you an indication of some of the, um, I would say, most visible barriers that separate um, that elite 3% from, from the rest. So this is all interesting, not fascinating, say, so what are we doing about it, right? So, so <laughs> what action can we do uh, or take to try to alleviate some of um, the uh, challenges that customers face as they refine their multi-cloud strategies. And that's exactly why we developed a new framework, uh, the Cisco Business Cloud Advisor, or BCA, in collaboration with IDC. It is a completely vendor agnostic uh, framework, and uh, it has uh, three components. The first allows you to basically learn about the latest cloud trends. So think of a number of documents that you can digest and gives you an idea about the latest cloud trends, by country in aggregate, also to see what your industry peers are, have been able to accomplish when it comes to the deployment of cloud services. But then we thought, okay, so how about developing tools and workshops that can make this information even more relevant and tailoring that to the cloud environment that you have in place. And so we developed the first tool, which is the Cisco BCA Adoption Report, which is online, self-service. Uh, you go to our website, cisco.com forward slash go BCA. Um, you can take this uh, quick self-assessment and receive a personalized report uh, regarding your current adoption of cloud services in the environment. But then we can um, tackle a much deeper conversation during a BCA workshop uh, in which we really sit down with the key stakeholders and better understand what challenges you face, what capabilities you have, what time frames, what you're trying to improve and at that point, the combination of, in the future, Domain 10, which is our enterprise class approach, um, and BCA will bring a very powerful framework that will help our customers with Cisco subject matter experts really put in place a solid plans based on data for a change uh, that can help you progress your multi-cloud journey. And that's future, and it will be delivered by Cisco 
directly to its customers. Well, we'll continue to make available the BCA workshop through our channel partners. And so qualified customers can obviously gain access to both. What type of organizations can benefit from this? Um, one of the nice parts associated with uh, the research is that you can benchmark organizations by geography, company size, and industry vertical. You can see a number of industry verticals actually reported on this line. Um, in terms of the audiences, the usual suspects is the CIO and CIO team, CIO team for the most part. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, just to let you know if you go on the website, cisco.com, go BCA, you'll find a number of deliverables, including some cloud-related trends at the country level. So if you want to know about what's happening in the UK, Germany, France, uh, Netherlands, and a few other countries, you can certainly uh, do that. Um, the more interesting uh, one is the Cisco BC Adoption Report online. As I mentioned, a brief number of questions, a multi-point, um, and it delivers a fairly personalized uh, type of uh, document along with benchmark, benchmark information uh, in which we compare you against that 6,100 organizations by industry, company size, and geography. We also added in the latest uh, version some essential guidance under the IDC banner uh, that depending on where you are in your multi-cloud journey, um, it highlights some of the areas that you could be looking at next to really improve uh, your uh, ability to succeed. And we also, which is a very important a differentiator of the model and what motivated uh, me to put it all together in conjunction with IDC is provide estimates. So suppose that you are at one given stage of cloud adoption, what type of improvements you would potentially see if you were to move to the next stage of cloud adoption uh, based on research as opposed to vendor hype. Now, the BCA workshop is uh, the bigger kahuna uh, so think a very detailed, in-depth set of questionnaires uh, and a high-touch engagement in which we sit face-to-face -face with the key decision makers in the account um, and we first build an organizational profile to understand your cost structure, but, but also more importantly, what objectives you're trying to reach, what capabilities you have, what inhibitors, and, 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 and that allows us to perform an analysis using the IDC methodology mapping you against the cloud adoption curve, but also identifying gaps, um, be that uh, across multiple focus areas that uh, we analyze. Uh, cloud services, security, risk mitigation, applications, um, and uh, multi use on multi-cloud environments, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the other aspect associated with the analysis is they're able to predict um, within uh, margin of error, because your mileage will always vary, um, if you were to uh, follow the IDC recommendations under a vendor agnostic barrier, banner, what, what, what type of improvements you could see for those key performance indicators that they studied. And that's a powerful uh, message because sometimes I feel uh, I'm in, in, in workshops that tend to be technologically laden and nothing wrong uh, against, you know, wrong with that. But at the end, people look each other in the eyes and say, well, how are we going to do all of this? We already have our you know, long to-do list. Um, where are we going to find the time to also progress and modernize our current IT environment? And if you don't have a business case, uh, it's hard to do. So part of the BCA workshop is to really help you and your management team understand the opportunity cost associated with the status quo. So if you're able to quantify it, it's a lot easier for you to go back and build a business case that promotes more aggressive and progressive uses of multi-cloud environments in your organization. Um, then we issue vendor agnostic guidance. So, okay, you say you get it, cloud downright can deliver better business outcomes. What are some of the areas that they need to continue to look at in order to get there? And, and that's exactly what we deliver, again, uh, based on market research, not opinions. Uh, some of the areas that we have seen our industry best practices across the sample that was analyzed. And only at that point, we switch from the what needs to be done to how it can be done. Because customers come to us not only to understand, um, okay, so where you are, right? But they also want to uh, fix the problems. And that's where we bring to bear the power of the Cisco portfolio 
the partner ecosystem uh, to really be, and the cloud professional services to really help customers achieve their objectives. Um, this is just an example to you know, make it clear. Suppose you are in the opportunistic stage of cloud adoption, you want to move to the repeatable as part of the deliverables that we would put together, forget the numbers, they're totally fictitious in this case, you will get the sense uh, across a number of KPIs and we analyze over 10, 15, I believe, uh, with precise definitions, how you're expected to, um, what type of improvements you could expect to see in your environment. Tailored, again, um, by company size, industry, and uh, geography. Of course, we have rolled this, uh, um, in North America, I would say, primarily, we are also rolling this out uh, across Europe, um, and we have received consistently good feedback from both our partner communities and um, customers. I happen to be aware of one customer um, here in, uh, in, in Europe who went through the methodology, was not necessarily an open stack related or specific, even if we do did talk, and we do talk uh, across the BCA uh, framework about open stack and open source technologies, it was not specific to open stack. And they're obviously a very sophisticated customer and they were able to still uh, find nuggets of information to continuously improve their multi-cloud strategies. Now, the last piece of uh, <clears throat> the puzzle is the Cisco Cloud Professional Services. You saw from the research how many of the barriers have nothing to do necessarily with technology per se, right? So we have introduced a number of cloud um, professional services uh, that our advanced services team is able to deliver today. And uh, we cluster them across uh, strategy and change management. So think the ability of really devise a strategy with our means that meet your needs so that you can embrace the cloud with confidence at your own pace based on your objectives. And along with that, IT transformation strategy is focused on DevOps, right? So that you can more confidently take advantage of these methodologies in your environment. But then once we have defined your true North Star when it comes to your multi-cloud, uh, how to navigate the multi-cloud maze you're in, then the next question is how can we help you shrink time to value for your multi-cloud services? And that's where the cloud acceleration services come in. They include, of course, OpenStack services. So in addition to the uh, private cloud as a service OpenStack option uh, that we deliver in which you require no uh, OpenStack expertise and you can focus on your applications, uh, some customers want uh, basically asked to help them uh, put together and build from the ground up an OpenStack based private cloud in a DIY fashion. And we're obviously able to do that from the simplest of the installations to the more complex um, for our, for example, telco customers. Uh, we have also partnered with uh, uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Apprenda uh, to deliver platform as a service capabilities uh, to help you accelerate the adoption of those technologies in the environment. Now, last but not least, multi-cloud government. Every time I talk to a customer, it's very interesting because um, inevitably, the challenge of optimizing their portfolio, they have a fleet of application, right? From traditional to the new cloud native. And uh, the challenge they face is, how do I best determine the allocation of the workloads across uh, multiple cloud deployment models? And that's exactly why we purchased Clicker. We acquired Clicker, now Cisco Cloud Center, because it allows you to model even homegrown applications before you deploy them in multi-cloud environments. So you can actually see ahead of the deployment what price performance characteristics you're likely to experience, not in general, but based on the workload you're facing. And that's a very powerful tool that changes the conversation right, from uh, probably guesstimates to actual um, data that then you use to put in place a structure and the decision matrix that allows you to more rigorously deploy applications across uh, various deployment models. And of course, we'll continue to enhance our cloud and application migration services that we have been offering also in conjunction with partners such as we ever made us. So we're very good at that. In summary, so you wonder 
uh, where can I get started? And I always encourage you know, just index yourself. See where you are using the unbiased IDC tools in your cloud journey. That will give you an idea first of your capabilities and will provide a repeatable framework, a structured unbiased framework to begin looking at your multi-cloud environments so that you can advance the conversation and bring a little bit of objectivity into the discussion, limiting the number of opinions that may be um, swirling around. Um, I'll leave you with a few resources if you are interested in learning more. Um, there is the, our website, cisco.com, go BCA. And if you have any questions, just email either now. Uh, of course, we have, I think, uh, still um, 10 minutes for the Q&A uh, session, but um, you can email us anytime at ciscobca, cisco.com, ciscobca, cisco.com, and uh, we'll uh, make sure we address your questions. So I hope this uh, was uh, of interest, um, and I'm uh, looking forward to you see if there is anyone with, uh, with questions. Yep, there is a microphone right behind you. I hate to tell you that, but. <laughs> yes. Uh, I should ask my question here. Uh, well, uh, with your BCA workshop, uh, what is the minimum size of uh, companies uh, in your customer portfolio? or in your focus port portfolio? Right, we typically do not tackle uh, SMB organizations. So in terms of a rough, right, um, their employee count, it would have to be above the 250, 500 employees, uh, but depends on the region, depends on the relationship you have with Cisco, uh, it's not a hard line. So if you're interested, you can just send me an email and we can uh, discuss with the regional leads the opportunity to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. A very good question, thank you for asking that. So at this point in time, things can always change in the future, right? <laughs> uh, we are making available to our partners, we are licensing to our partners uh, both tools, the uh, adoption report, so the online, and the methodology to conduct a face-to-face -face workshops free of charge. Uh, we do not charge our customers at this point in time uh, for the BCA workshop either. Uh, what will happen in the future as we build and integrate and we bring the advanced services capabilities um, um, to bear in conjunction with the BCA methodology. With Domain 10, that's a billable consulting engagement that you can take advantage of and, and that will be delivered directly to Cisco to its direct customers. Right. So anything I, ch I, I told you will obviously change and is subject to change, but that's <laughs> the way it is today. So if, you're, if you have an interest, just uh, let us know and we'll follow up. How much time do you use normally to conduct that kind of work of a day or a day? Thank you for asking that question. So uh, the process is very straightforward. Uh, we typically share the questionnaires ahead of time because they tend to be uh, fairly in-depth, right? So we give you a little bit of time to um, gather the information. Just to give you a rule of thumb, organization the size of Cisco IT took about 10 hours to get the data in, right? Um, it, it's not an overwhelming um, um, exercise for a well-run IT organization. I guess that's the first test, right? How long does it take to gather the data? Um, and then once you have the data, we can have the workshop. And it's typically two to three hours. Uh, participating workshops in which uh, there is a high level of engagement from the CIO, so we could protract, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and then we analyze, right, so, so we, it's think time for us, the Cisco and the partner team. We analyze the results, we, we, we think about what we heard, and we come back with a set of findings uh, and recommendations. And that discussion typically is less than two hours. Again, depending on the size of the organization, of course, the complexity, it could change, but those are the average numbers we have seen so far. Any other questions? Okay, well, I hope this uh, was clear and thank you for joining.